This is Adam DePore, customer service expert, author, and speaker, and I am here on the expert interview series with the inimitable Shep mm. Hyken. Inimitable. That's inimitable. a good word. I, I had to throw that word in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Shep because you probably already know, but he's a customer service expert, customer experience expert, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, best-selling author, Hall of Speaking, uh, that Hall of Fame, uh, Speaker's Hall of Fame for the National Speakers Association, excuse me, there is no Hall of Speaking, but if there was, Shep would be in it, let's be very clear about that. I'd be sweeping the hall. <laughs> You'd be sweeping the hall, exactly. But he is all over the place, interviews, blogs, podcasts, traditional media, he's got a bunch of books out, Most of Magic, Cult of the Customer, The Amazement Revolution, everything. And Shep works with companies and organizations who want to build loyal relationships with their customers and employees. And he has worked with Fortune 100, small businesses, and he also has the Customer Focus, which is a customer service training program, which helps clients develop a customer service culture and loyalty mindset. And with all of that, he is still gracing us with our, his presence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Shep. So glad to have you. Great to be here, man. Thanks, Adam. All right, cool. Well, I was fortunate enough to do your amazing podcast, and we use the word amazing because it is the Amazing Business Radio, and we discovered when we were talking on that podcast that we have something in common, and we both come from small business. We've got entrepreneurial background. We've sort of got that in our blood, and I love your story about your magic business and sort of how that informed your customer service and customer experience framework and ideas. So just tell us a little bit about that background in the magic business. Sure. So in the magic business, I was 12 years old and started a birthday party magic show business where I would go to children's birthday parties and perform uh, about maybe 45 minutes to an hour long show, give a lot of candy away to the kids, make them happy. By the way, that's customer service, giving those kids candy. <laughs> but uh, you know, when I did my first magic show, I came home and my mom told me, go write a thank you note. And that was my first uh, like, wow, great idea. And I didn't know it was called customer service. My dad said, that's a good idea. In a week, I want you to call the parents back up. I want you to say thank you again. And then ask them, what do they like about the show? Did they like the show? Did you do a good job? Get some feedback. Little did I know, feedback. Wow, that's all we talk about today. Feedback, analytics, You know, get customer information, listen to the customer. Uh, this is all happening when I'm 12 years old, back in the night, well, I don't wanna tell you when, but it was a long time ago. And then, um, I, my dad would say things like, you know, son, you know, if you show up on time, basically that's late because if your show is scheduled to start at one o'clock and I had this thing set up where my, I had my box, I, my suitcase, I would open it up and it would convert to the table and then all the props were laying exactly where they needed to be. I do the trick. I put it right back, getting ready for the next show. Cause I was doing sometimes four, maybe five on a really, really busy day, five magic shows and I'm zipping in setting up in literally 60 seconds or less, I'm ready to go. But my dad said, if you show up on time, they're already looking at their watch like 10 or 15 minutes before going, when's the magician going to be here? And he said, you need to show up at least 15 minutes ahead of time. And so these were the lessons that I learned, not realizing that's called customer service. And here I am today. And believe it or not, I, what I preach to my clients from the you know people to people interaction end, it's exactly what my parents were preaching to me when I was 12 years old. It's unbelievable. You know, it's, it's like uh, you've basically got a culture of one because you, <laughs> right? I mean, you, you're taught this culture and you're taught this customer centric ethic, which that's what we call it nowadays. Of course, mm -hmm. those, that phrase wasn't around then. And, you know, that's, it's really amazing because when you think about that, I mean, I learned those lessons too. I grew up you know, in my father's business and grew up in my mother's business and my grandfather's business. And they were very customer focused. And you, you just learn how important that is. And when you look at large organizations, we talk about, you know, that expression, culture eats strategy for life, right? right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've seen this in your training. The more I work in customer experience, I seem to run into the fact that culture is so much at the root of problems, right? It's, it's, it's so often where the problems start. So tell us a little bit about, like, what are some of the key ingredients leaders need to know to create a great service culture? And how do they get started with that? Well, I, and I think your, your comment where it all starts and, and it erodes. By the way, the one bad apple syndrome is applicable here where one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. I mean, you have a department, you might, you know, it could be a small department within a really large company, but it's still an important department. And one person can erode the, the enthusiasm and the confidence of everyone else. If you have 
a thousand great people in your company and one bad person, and your customer happens to talk to that one bad person that day, guess what? The perception of your entire company, the other 1,000 employees, it's not good. So, but to your, your basic question, which is, you know, how do you uh, start to create that customer focused or customer centric culture? And I actually have a six step process and I'm happy to take you through it. I don't know if you even know what it is or not. I don't actually. So this is first I've heard of that. Let's do it. Sure. And I can do it. I'll do it in 60 to uh, 90 seconds. How's that? That's my Great. goal. So <laughs> six steps. The first is leadership has to define what great customer service is. And by defining, I mean create a one-sentence definition, similar to what the Ritz-Carlton calls their credo, which is, we're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That's nine words long, and I think it explains everything. By the way, this doesn't count toward my 90 seconds. Yesterday, <laughs> I was talking to a client. We were talking about this, and I said, "What we need to sit down and define it. He goes, oh, we've got a great definition. And this is what he said. We, what, we love our customers so much that when we kiss them, we want their lips to bleed. <laughs> I go, Whoa, this is fantastic. You're right. So now everything we're going to do is train to how to make those lips metaphorically bleed. You know, obviously, that's a metaphor. All right. So number one is to find it. Number two is to disseminate or communicate what that vision is. Make sure everybody knows it. Uh, the Ritz Carlton has a little laminated card everybody carries around. I've gone into organizations that have, you know, nice little cool coins, heavy, thick coins about the size of a silver dollar, has that mantra, that one sentence on there. Anyway, you communicate it, next you train to it. That's the third step. Train everybody. Now they all know it's there, now let's train them and make sure they do it. And by the way, that's everybody in the company. Customer service is not a department, it's a philosophy to be embraced by everyone. The front lines train differently than somebody in accounting and finance or somebody in the warehouse, but they all understand what the vision of the company is when it comes to customers. So that's number three. Number four, leadership actually role models and sets the example for everyone. Number five is that they keep it in alignment. It, 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 one of the most important questions I ever asked the CEO is, what's your job? Day in and day out, what's the most important thing that you do? And one of these very savvy individuals said, I defend the culture. It's going out of alignment, we get it back into alignment. And then finally, number six is to celebrate uh, when it's working and let everybody know it's working. Now, that's a simple process, but simple doesn't mean easy, which means if you've got 50 people in your company or 100 people, easy. You can turn your culture around literally in, in weeks, maybe a month or two. If you've got 50,000 employees, we're talking several years, maybe five to seven years. And you've got to be willing to work it and work it hard. And so that's the key. Simple doesn't mean easy, but it is a simple process. And if you follow it, we'll get you where you want to go. Well, yeah, and I like when you talked about alignment, because that's one of the things I see, you know, I've even heard of the coin before. And I see sometimes where they are trying to do these things at the top, but as they work their way through the six step process, something gets lost, you know, through the steps at some right. point. You know, there's, okay. there's a challenge with execution. So where do you see, you know, is it, is it in the interview room? Is it the bad hires and the bad apples? And it, and well, it's yeah, and it, we're going to make the assumption you're not starting from scratch and hiring your first customer service rep or your first salesperson or just going from the solo entrepreneur to the second employee. You, most people, when they come to me, most clients, they already have a staff. What are they going to do with them? I would tell them from this point forward, make sure you're hiring right, not just for the right attitude and the skill, but for the personality of the company that you're trying to create. So uh, that's important. Hiring right, training, and it's constantly training, not one time. It's not training isn't something you did, it's something you do, and you do it ongoing. And that means maybe a big training to start things off, but many trainings. And it could be when I say many, M I N I, not many as in many, <laughs> but many trainings. They could be, uh, you know, we have a system that we set up where each of our clients. Uh, we'll have a team meeting and we give them one topic a week to talk about and they will spend five minutes on it, maybe. And that's all they need to do. We have other clients that want to do it once a month. We have, one, uh, uh, we have a client that wants every day for them to get some type of a customer service message. And we talk to them about what that message should be and how to set it up and we help them do that. So frequency is important. Constant reinforcement to create sustainability. 
All right, it's interesting because that's the key. I mean, we do something similar, a little different, but yeah, it's got, you've got to reinforce training. It, like, I love your quote that it's not something you did, it's something you do because you've got to reinforce it. If you go in and give a speech or do a workshop, that's great. That's a little bit of education, maybe a little bit of alignment, mm -hmm. some motivation, but if you don't reinforce it over time, and that's a cultural thing, that's where we go back to culture, where you have the drive, the desire, and the focus to do that, I don't think it is ever effective. Well, it is effective. So let's let's talk about that. If you hire or if a client hires you or me to come in and do a presentation and we both do good presentations and maybe it's a, a one hour all day training, doesn't matter. About, let's, let's just use a simple number of 100. About 15 of those people a month from now might remember what we did, 10 to 15. Okay, that's it, 10 or 15%. Now, my response is, you know, it's a shame that the other 85 to 90% didn't remember it because, you know, they're off doing other things. They got busy. And there's a, a group of those people that would never get it no matter what. There's no doubt. But here's the thing about the 10 or 15%. The change that they make is going to more than pay for you and I being there. But I still think that's ripping the client off. We want to give them more than 10 or 15%, even though that might be more than enough to pay for us. What if they could get 50 to 60%, 70 or 80%? You know, as I mentioned, some people, you know, you can talk to them till they're blue in the face. They may not have the personality to deliver what we're talking about here. That doesn't mean they're not right for the company. It means they belong maybe in a different position and people understand. Uh, I know we're jumping around here. Here comes another shiny object, squirrel, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but, you know, behavioral style profiling, where you actually take a look at the behavioral styles of the people that you're, you know, are, that you're working with. And you may find that here is an individual that really is uncomfortable talking to people, not just customers, but even internally talking to their own employees. Um, I'm not picking on IT people, but typically they're a certain type of personality that many times don't interact well with gregarious, outgoing, socializing salespeople, right? Yeah, of course. Right? And I think I, that's one of the things you and I have always bonded on or uh, agreed on that I don't think everybody who does what we do or you do or I do, whatever, uh, really believes. You know, I don't believe everybody can be saved. I believe there are certain people that are mm -hmm. just not meant to be in customer facing roles. They just don't have the personality. Right. And especially pro proactive service sort of that's a little bit that's a broader subset but when you get into reactive service and pride and how people react to being challenged or confronted or anger you know then then the set shrinks right right and you know the proactive thing so i mean even if a person isn't outgoing and shouldn't be in a customer facing job doesn't mean they can't work well within the environment you know we talk about hey you need to adapt your personality to match someone else's when you're doing business with them. Internally, if I'm working with somebody, you know, example, my assistant, when he came to work for me, I said, here's the deal, Quentin. My personality is quite different than yours. Now, you are gonna have to adapt to me a lot more often than I have to adapt to you. Now, I realize if I'm asking you to do something and it's somewhat complicated, uh, I need to adapt to your style. I need to be more methodical in my thinking, more uh, explanatory so it's a little bit more detail-oriented. But when you come to me, man, don't give me all the details. I don't want it. I want, like, what do I need to know? <laughs> That's what I need to know is what I need to know, okay? I don't need to know all the little background behind it. I know you want the background, so, you know, we'll, it's give and take, you know, okay? but I know I have to match every once in a while and he's got to match as well. That's why you and I get along so well, Shep. <laughs> Just tell me what I need to know. Let's go. <laughs> I know, <back>. exactly. <laughs> well, and you know, I do it in the style that you need to hear and like to hear. And that's, and that's great. And, you know, to your point, everybody's in the customer experience, even if they're not customer facing, it's still important that the IT guys, we're not picking on them. I, I have plenty of IT guys I love and gals, excuse me, but you know, they still have to have that piece in the customer experience. So that's one of the things that's really changed in customer service, customer experience, that whole idea of shifting to a total experience, looking at an entire journey. And one of the things I love about nowadays is the fact that there is so much science and data around everything to do with customers right. and customer experience. And I've learned so much. And yeah, I came up in that traditional like MBA, uh, you know, command and control, and I've learned things over the last, I mean, things that over 10 or 15 years, I've changed my ideas about uh, employee empowerment, culture, job satisfaction. 
So I know you've been in this game. But we're not going to date you, but let's just say a good bit longer than me. <laughs> and, you know, you've seen, you've seen all this stuff, but what have you seen that's not so much a change in the landscape, but where, you know, you've gotten some new information or science or research has changed what you believed or taught or how you approached it? Yeah, I mean, there's so much changing. It, you know, it used to be back when I started the business, uh, it was really front line. Customer service was all about the front line. And then they started coming up with this concept of customer experience, which, by the way, was primarily maybe 80% about customer service. And then somebody said, oh, but the experience is much more than that. When I bought my, you know, uh, iPod, remember the little iPod? Now it's a, now it's a smartphone, but back, they still sell iPods, I guess, little iPods. But um not yeah, a little little thing. And I remember just opening the box was an experience. And and Steve Jobs said, Yeah, the experience starts before you ever, you know, actually use the product and maybe even actually call and get support and get help. And so now the customer experience is so much bigger. And phone, now there's phone and there's uh, online and there's social media and there's so many technologies and channels and customer support. You know, something you just mentioned, I want to get to it because I think it's really important because I think it ties into some things we talked about earlier. You used the word journey a few moments ago. And I think it's important that every client or every company that we work with and any company that we don't work with for that matter, uh, it really takes a look at that journey that the customer takes. And there's different journeys. A repeat customer is going to be different than the brand new customer. Maybe a customer that has a complaint is going to come in in a different way and deal with with a different part of the company, but map the journeys out. And at the top, you have what we call touch points. That's a pretty common term. But behind the scenes, these people like, uh, and we mentioned IT, but what about the people in the warehouse? In the warehouse, what about the people who are in finance and accounting who may, you know, send an invoice but never ever really talk to a customer? Well, they impact the customer. Hence, what's happening behind the scenes is called an impact point. So. I learned about the concept of the customer journey back in the early 1980s when I was reading uh, and studying Jan Carlson, who eventually came out with a book titled Moments of Truth. And I don't know how much of it he talked about in the Moment of Truth book, but he, he took the journey of a typical passenger of his airline, Scandinavian Airlines. You know, they, they see advertisements and that's a, a big important a moment of truth. But from the people to people standpoint, they get their ticket by, you know, picking up the phone and making a reservation. Then they check their bags at the curb. And, the, you know, and finally they get it there to the destination. But there's all these little touch points along the way, you know, going to the ticket counter, taking care by the flight attendant. But let's talk about what happens behind the scenes. That person behind the scenes, underneath, you know, you, you check your bag and it goes down the conveyor belt. You see it going down somewhere. <laughs> and then it ends up on the right airplane. And then from the right airplane, it ends up on a cart that somehow gets it to the baggage carousel. I don't know how many hands touch that bag, uh, how many, you know, scan tags there are today, whatever technology. There is so much happening behind the scenes. I call those impact points that impact the ultimate end experience. If any of those impact points fall short, the customer's overall experience is bad. And you know what? There's a lot of people that the customer never sees and those people never see the customer who are in charge of those impact points. They're extremely important. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the offstage, onstage, all, yep. all that stuff. When you look at the customer experience, it's so funny. We're talking about this today. This morning, I was listening to a podcast I love, but I'm not going to mention it because I'm about to diss uh, one of the guests. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, and I hear this guy talking about, he's talking, he's talking about customer value and he had this whole pitch and he's talking about customer journeys. Like, well, you know, I talked to my credit card company one time and two times and three times and customers don't want a journey. Like, no, that's, that's not what it is. That's, that's, no, no, no. <laughs> they, they, you're, He's right. He's just using the wrong words. Exactly. And I'm, and I'm trying to say, like, wow, this is still so new to so many people. Because this is some guy, this is a person who is focused on, um, you know, customer retention and research and all of these things. And I'm realizing that there's just still so much of the world that haven't been exposed to these ideas. So uh, the good news is we have a lot of work we can still do. Yeah. And, you know, when he says the customer doesn't want a journey, what the customer doesn't want is friction exactly. along the journey. <laughs> exactly. Okay. If the journey is a good journey, they want the journey. Exactly. Oh, it's just, <laughs> they don't want the hassle. They don't want to have to. I was just sitting here listening to somebody in the office next door before you called, and this is what I hear them doing. Agent. Agent. Agent, <laughs> agent, agent. And I know they're talking to that virtual response. And by the way, I've been joking about this now for several weeks. 
because she keeps doing it. I keep hearing her calling the credit card companies and the, you know, whoever that she's talking to, but she did it again today. I thought, oh no, it's happening again. <laughs> Twilight Zone. <laughs> All right, well, speaking of uh, automated computers and our interfacing with them, let's talk a little bit about the future of customer experience, because as you mentioned earlier, I mean, everything is just changing. It is almost overwhelming to try to keep up. And you know, you and I, we get asked, we do interviews, what's the future of customer service? But I wanna put a little twist on it. Okay. What, what you're most excited about in the future? Like mm. what's coming up that you think's really gonna change the game for the better? So I think, you know, anything that is coming up is trending right now. There, and, and I love when people say to me, you know, is it true customer service is getting worse? The statistics are showing that you know, there's a larger amount of dissatisfied customers today by a percentage than there were, you know, six months or a year or five years ago. And, and here's my response to that. It's not getting worse. It's actually getting better. Um, and so there's two parts of that. It's the customer's perception of customer service that's also getting better. They're more attuned to what good service is. They're smarter about the choices they make with the companies they do business with. And here is the key. They no longer compare, uh, like if you go to Starbucks or another coffee company or coffee you know, shop, you're not comparing each other anymore. If you go into Starbucks and you have a great experience with their people and then you go to the bookstore and look at that, there's a dated concept, <laughs> but there's still a few of them around, okay? But you, you, go go to a you go to a bookstore, you can go and do business at the movie theater or you can even be at work talking to a vendor and that vendor isn't as friendly as the barista that you just dealt with at Starbucks you're saying why can't they be as nice and as friendly as the people at Starbucks you know this is a totally different experience over here it's not Starbucks but you know what we're comparing as as customers and consumers we're comparing our experiences to companies that aren't direct that aren't direct competitors of the companies and businesses that we are doing business with. As a result, our expectations as a customer are much higher. Now, those companies out there that are good are touting how great they are. They're winning the awards, the you know J.D. Power, the Malcolm Baldridge Awards, and any other great awards in customer service. They're winning all these awards, and they're good. Guess what? The companies that aren't winning the awards are starting to say, well, we're doing that too. Well, it's just taken a while for them to catch up. So I think that uh, with, with all that's happening, we're trending right. Another thing that's exciting me is all the technology that's out there. And I think that data is allowing us to create a better experience. Sure, it allows us to know what to sell, who likes what we sell. But more importantly, if you are really using the data properly, you know what I want. Amazon's brilliant at this. Oh, gosh. I go back onto an Amazon, uh, I go on Amazon every if not every day maybe, but every couple, three days to buy something. I mean, I love them. And when I go on, I go, hello, chef, welcome back. That's what it says. Hey, last time you were here, this is what you looked at. I go, yeah, I'm, I, I want to get that right now. Thank you. Click, done, okay? <laughs> and, and so they're using the data to analyze what I like, and they're really creating a strong, customized, and personalized experience. And I think that excites me is that with all this technology, hopefully we're going to give customers a better personalized and customized experience. With great technology, we're gonna be able to respond quicker to customers' needs, complaints, questions, problems, and solutions that they need help with that aren't necessarily driven by a complaint or anger, but just, I need your help. And they could be self-service solutions, they could be video-based, they could be uh, you know, mobile video where you can talk to an individual just like you and I are talking today. There's so many different ways that technology is going to enhance that experience. So. I'm excited for a lot, but then again, I am the eternal optimist. <laughs> well, you should be if you're in customer service. And you know, one thing that's actually, I'll, I'll layer onto that that's super exciting about what you just said is with service as a software, that technology and that power is actually accessible to smaller businesses too. Oh yeah, the cloud opportunities. Uh, you know, just CRM has evolved from basic contact management to really managing a relationship and being able to, you know, allow other people in the company to see parts of a record. So when they're dealing with the customer, I mean, there's so many cool things that are happening with the software that's out there. Yeah, it is awesome. All right, well, we talked about the past, we talked about the future, we talked about the present. So I really appreciate your time, Chef. Can you tell everybody uh, 
where to find you? I know it's a loaded question because you are everywhere, but uh, where, where would you like people to find well, you? With a name like Shep Hyken, it's so common. If you Google that name, there's thousands of us. No, just <laughs> you can Google. Actually, I think if you just put in the name Shep, the first thing that comes up is Shep the dog. And it's, <laughs> uh, maybe uh, Shep, uh, there, I don't know, there's a couple other Sheps out there. But no, Hyken.com, H-Y-K-E-N.com. That's my website. That's the easiest way to reach me. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Hyken. Um, if you want to check out videos, go to ShepTV.com. That's my YouTube channel. Actually, uh, I think we've got about almost 500 short little videos that we encourage companies to basically use in place of me. <laughs> no, no, I hope not. But no, they do use them in their meetings and their short little how-to, here's a quick tip type video. And uh, I hope that people take advantage of that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Shep. And by the way, to everybody, his Shep's YouTube channel is absolutely fascinating and thank wonderful. It, I really, truly, you give away so much for free on there. It is amazing. So make sure to check that out. And thank you so much, Shep. Thank you. And really appreciate you having me on the show, man. Thanks.